Isaiah Berlin, one of Oxford's most colourful figures, is best known for his work in political theory and the history of ideas. But he began his career at Oxford in the 1930s in conventional philosophy and was one of the members of a group which was the beginning of what came to be known as Oxford philosophy. The group included A.J. Eyre and J.L. Austin, as well as Stuart Hampshire, who discusses the Oxford tradition, and especially Austin's work, with Berlin in this film. Hampshire has recently returned to Oxford after periods as Professor of Philosophy, first in London and then at Princeton. He's written literary criticism and a book on Spinoza, but is best known for a work of moral philosophy called Thought and Action. For me, Oxford philosophy begins really in 1936, but for you it has a longer background, and I think we ought to talk about the background, because there are some conditions which are permanent in Oxford philosophy in any case, yes, no matter what the school. Yes, certainly Oxford philosophy didn't uh, come out of the blue in 1936, even what is called Oxford philosophy. I suppose I must have begun philosophy as an undergraduate in 1929 or so, and it was a very lively place. It was by no means uniform. There were all kinds of philosophers about. There were some uh, Hegelians who represented the sort of fag end of the Hegelian tradition in England. People like Durkheim, like Collingwood, the disciples, people like Muir and Weldon and so on. On the one side, on the other side, there were the British realists. There was Pritchard, there was Ross. Um, and uh, their disciples, people like Price, and was Ryle, and so on, and the discussion was extremely lively. But there were two quite different approaches. The Hegelians really wanted to have some kind of large worldview, um, um, and wanted to fit everything in, into it. Mm. But of course, uh, uh, in the British tradition, it did become rather degenerate. Uh, uh, huge inflated constructions began, language became inflated, and the whole thing was... Um, some, some of it, anyhow, was rather like bad literature, some of it was rather good scholarship. Against that, there were people who reacted sharply against this kind of inflation, and under the influence, certainly, of Moore and Russell, wanted to philosophy to be precise, to be clear. Uh, before building an enormous building, they wanted to test every brick, because of the discredit into which huge Hegelian inflation had fallen. That's really what happened, I think. These two schools of philosophers were really at odds with each other, and each accused each other of different things. The um, clear-headed philosophers who wanted to do things piecemeal uh, called the Hegelian philosophers, said the Hegelian philosophers indulged in what they called toki toki. The Hegelian philosophers accused the um, piecemeal philosophers of argy bargy. Yeah. And so we divided into argy bargy and toki toki. However, this communicated the great deal of life and spirit. But it was all uh, contained within Oxford, actually within the walls of Oxford. There wasn't a world audience uh, in the sense no, of the United no, States. No. And furthermore, uh, no. we were cut off, uh, when I remember it, that is in the early 30s, up to 36, from Cambridge, largely, apart from the influence of Moore. Is that fair? Yes, or is I that think it's fair, yes. I think it's fair. In the early years, certainly, I don't know that we knew what was going on. Moore, of course, yes. Russell was no longer there. And in the later years, of course, wisdom made a considerable impact upon us. Ah, yes. But there was a bit later. There was a bit later. The, by the time wisdom's writings became influential, and they were very influential, well, Austin was concerned. Austin was greatly impressed by wisdom in the 30s. Yes. But then by that time, taking it from 36 onwards, by that time, there was something you could call analytical philosophy. Yes, existed. the thing about Oxford was, you see, that there were a great many philosophers here, always, at least in my time, the, the sheer number was very large. Philosophy thrives on discussion, on dialogue, on conversation. And if we could convince each other, that's all we wanted. We didn't, I mean, the reason why so comparatively little was published was that if we could convince each other in our little discussion groups, or even in tutorials, or whatever it might be, um, this was enough. People didn't really seek a wider audience, nor did they feel uh, there was one. Perhaps the easiest way to mark the transition which occurred in the mid-30s when analytical philosophy began would be to consider the discussions that took place in your room from about 36 onwards, at which uh, Eyre was present and Austin was present and four or five others, and the topics we discussed, because we were then self-consciously the new philosophers. And um, Freddie Eyre's book, Language, Truth and Logic, which was written really under the influence of Carnap, who ought to be mentioned. I mean, in effect, it was the adaptation to English empiricist philosophy of Carnap's logical ideas, which had, uh, were the center of the old Vienna Circle. The Carnap was a central figure of the Vienna Circle, and Freddie Erd brought the ideas of the Vienna Circle, turned them into excellent English, and adapted them
to fit the philosophy of Hume and Moore in which he was brought up at Christchurch with Ryle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, we took this as the text which we were to discuss, uh, not, not literally the book, but the set of ideas which went with it, which Predier defended and Austin and you attacked. And I can re recall very well, as I'm sure you can, the range of topics we discussed. We discussed hypothetical propositions. We discussed your celebrated proposition that pink, as of that chair, is more like red than it is like blue. And how can we uh, exhibit that proposition as fitting into either of the two boxes which Carnap and Air provided, namely logical truths or empirical statements? It doesn't appear to be either a truth of logic or a truth certifiable by reference to the meaning of words alone, nor to be an empirical statement. That we discussed endlessly. We discussed also induction and the nature of natural laws. We discussed um, disjunctive propositions, uh, propositions of the either or kind. We um, discussed, I suppose, ethics occasionally, mm. though it's very important that um, one of the effects of positivism uh, of the Vienna Circle and that form of it which I represented to us was that it made ethics and political philosophy seem to have very little rational content of any kind. Yeah. And uh, they were... Uh, yeah. yes. Something in there, of course. Well, I think what happened about ethics, ethics was uh, quite fashionable when I was first up because people were very uh, passionate uh, moralists like Richard and Moore talked a great deal about it and this certainly communicated itself to both dons and undergraduates. But it's true that politics in particular, political philosophy, had become rather discredited owing to the fact that it seemed a monopoly of these decayed Hegelians mm -hmm. and therefore suffered from the general discredit into which this kind of tuppence-colored inflated language had fallen. Uh, and that I think is why political philosophy was disregarded. The whole atmosphere was towards away from huge, not only really intelligible masses of words into something which was clear and distinct and honest and um, lucid and empirical and provided one could sort of deflate the language and get, get talking about something which one really could understand and operate with, um, one felt that perhaps it was a subject that worth discussing. Otherwise, one was constantly moving about in this foggy atmosphere. And I'm afraid that's what made politics suffer. The curious thing was, of course, you see that, well, of course, there was always there were papers in it in the examinations for the, for the young men. Um, indeed, in PPE, which was meant to be a school which uh, emphasized uh, political philosophy to a large extent. Karl Marx was a set book. I read it as a set book. Textual criticism of Karl Marx was enforced upon all undergraduates during PPE, quite a large school. Mm. And so it I certainly know. wasn't there just to be knocked down or refuted or mocked. And as far as I know, that went on until the war. But somehow, the relevance of what Karl Marx said or what even, or what political philosophers said to the question of uh, appearance and reality, or as you say, or the, uh, empirical versus um, logical propositions and so on, didn't seem so evident. And even very lively and imaginative Marxists, you remember our friend um, N.O. Brown, for example, who wrote yeah, Love's yeah. Body, who since then achieved a huge reputation in America, yes. certainly never allowed his passionate Marxist views of that period to have any relevance at all uh, to the question of, say, the nature of perception or um, the nature of truth. Yes, well that was a, the great utility within English thought of the Vienna Circle is it provided something, a hard doctrinal position, very clearly stated, logically articulated, yes. which we could then say, well it fails at this point, it fails at that point, but it yes. focused discussion. Yes. And we felt that we left the past of amateurishness and indeed of a certain provincialism yes, right. of the Oxford of um, Pritchard and Joseph were indeed, uh, the, there was a very formidable argument about moral philosophy, but it was all in a very small, enclosed world, really, an Oxford world, which clever young men did, and they became clever at argument, but really these tricks of argument which they learnt, which is perhaps unfair to call them tricks, but skill in argument which they acquired, was something they applied elsewhere, but scarcely at all to the issues after they left. I mean, it didn't leave any trace. While, the, after all, the Vienna Circle was a conscious anti-clerical, in a sense anti, what would now be called anti-establishment movement, because it dismissed most of traditional religious and moral belief as wholly unscientific and, and therefore not, not tolerable, no, no rational man.
was allowed to pay any attention to these beliefs. Uh, yes, I think you're quite right. I think the general, uh, uh, there were certain general implications of uh, logical positivism and of all these positive doctrines which we imbibed. They were, of course, uh, incompatible with metaphysics, incompatible with theology, so to speak. They, they did have, in this sense, uh, an effect which was frightfully deprecated by people who like that sort of thing. I mean, the conservatives, and particularly, uh, I don't say religious, but theologically minded orthodox persons, certainly looked on this as a terrible subversive movement in that sense. Oh, yes, very much human, strong. Rather, rather like humans in the 18th century, it was regarded as uh, um, spreading the whole thing, so to speak. I mean, dissolving the fabric of society almost for people who really feared it and hated it. And it went fairly well with our general convictions at the time. I don't know about most philosophers in Oxford. But there was no doubt that in our particular group, the tendency was on the whole, I would say, towards the left rather than towards the right. The horizon in Europe was terribly clouded, of course. I mean, um, with Hitler and Mussolini and uh, Daladier and Chamberlain and Schuschnigg about with only Roosevelt for the point of light in the world, we were on the whole turned in that particular direction. I remember very well about Austin, for example, who was normally regarded as an unpolitical person. He was a man who went to, he went to the Soviet Union as a tourist mm. in, I can't remember when, I should think about 1933 or 34, and came back deeply impressed by the discipline and by the austerity of life and so forth, and remained under that influence for some time. And certainly I should have thought, I don't know how he voted, but no doubt. Well, he was a Labour voter, I'm sure. Um, I'm as sure. Lord Einstein knew him. I'm sure. And he was and also very... very views. I, was, uh, I suppose I, I was brought up during Abyssinia and Spain, and these things have permanently altered my thought. I, I can't think about politics except in terms of a certain amount of black and white, where uh, totalitarianism does represent a very, very black kind of regime indeed. We were conditioned by what went on in the 30s and yes. remained permanently under the influence of that, at least I can speak for myself. Yes. This is what um, shaped my thought ever after. I really can't escape from the influence of those dreadful years. It, it's interesting, uh, uh, particularly about Austin, that he was very much a practical reformer in all practical matters. And uh, practical matters were something that greatly absorbed him. I mean, he was one of the most efficient administrators that the university is known in many ways in, in the press and as a proctor and so on. Uh, later, I'm speaking now, of course, after the war, but at the very beginning he had this very strong practical bent. And curiously enough, the practical bent goes with, in him and I think in many others, a desire to separate issues into distinct issues and a great repugnance for large, sloppy, all-embracing systems of thought, which Magic. really filled him yes. with a disgust. And this disgust that he had for the kind of pre-Moore, pre-G-Moore systems of thought was the same impulse that made him attend to problems in a very fair-minded and very deliberate and a very unprejudiced and un establishment minded, I think one could say, unconservative, well, unstuffy it's way. part of Oxford that I wouldn't say that there's something original or new in him. I mean, the idea of piecemeal solutions, yes. one by one, is something which all these, which I think he was taught by people, uh, I don't say taught, but anyhow, which was of a piece with. Uh, Pritchard particularly. Well, Pritchard particularly. Pritchard deeply influenced, deeply impressed him anyhow. Yes. Yeah, his uh, whole uh, doctrine, some, even the performative doctrine, uh, was something to Pritchard. But also, um, Ryle and Price and all these uh, instructors of our youth, Yes. Uh, rather dealt with problems rather in that fashion. I mean, the, the systems were out because of the, as I say, with the discrediting of these huge inflated monsters, which I referred to earlier, but it's perfectly true about Austin. He wanted to be rational above all things. When, whenever he used the word rational, it was, it was for him the highest possible adjective of praise. Yes. And I used to disagree with him about that. He used to think that life had rational ends, we must discover what they are and pursue them. He really had absolute 18th century faith in rationality of a certain kind. And uh, that is why I think he likes examining these problems, as you say, one by one. He just wanted to be absolutely clear about what we were saying without any interference by some kind of bullying or tyrannical system or box into which these things had to be stuffed. Uh, I think there was some a priori conviction that the truth had to be like this or had to be like that. And that was very refreshing. It is, of course, very strange that someone who uses sensible as almost a supreme adjective of praise, which he did about persons, should be a philosopher, because on the whole one doesn't look to philosophy, traditionally speaking, as a repository of this uh, rather prosaic quality, as it appears. But it was really a sort of feature, it was a feature, it absolutely was a feature of analytical philosophy as derived from Moore and from the logical positivists of the old Vienna circle of our air, and later of Wittgenstein, because we haven't yet spoken of him, that we should always discuss philosophy in a very quiet, uh, 
any possible ironical or at any rate unexcited and unrhetorical. I mean, rhetoric of any kind was excluded and would have been thought just absurd. And Austin carried this to an extreme. Even the most solemn questions, solemn in their associations, had to be disinfected by a very calm committee man's tone of voice in speaking yes. about them. Mind you, I think there were two Austins in that sense. There was the private Austin and there was the um, Austin in in, the, this big in group discussion where the yes. philosophical side is otherwise. I, I, I suppose I must have generated since 1932. I used to talk to him every morning about philosophy for two or three hours. He was certainly yes. the ablest person I ever knew intimately amongst philosophers. Yes. When he was alone with one, he was marvelous to talk with because he didn't insist on one translating one's own language into his language or some particularly official language into which everything had to be translated. He understood what one said perfectly, talked about it with extreme acuteness and lucidity and made one's thoughts race. Really had a profound effect on one. was very clever, very firm and was not obviously trying to convert one to a particular point of view. It wasn't either preaching to one or bullying one or trying to trip one up or any of those things. Mm -hmm. When, of course, he found himself uh, in uh, with a group or a society, there's a certain competitive instinct and that he took over. Yes. And I can't deny it, he then wanted to win. Yes. And this desire to achieve victory sometimes led him into arguments which perhaps were slightly specious at times. Uh, he was usually much cleverer than his competitors yes. and usually did win. But uh, the, the kind of way one wanted to talk to him was when he was entirely alone face to face. Then I think he was at his best. I learned more from him in that way than I think I ever learned from anybody. Yes, well, it, it is worth going into the history, I think. Um, I also had very long conversations with him mm -hmm. uh, in All Souls, in the afternoons, and mm -hmm. after lunch. We used to mm -hmm. talk for a long time, and that's 36, 37, when he just moved to Morden. Before that, from the point of view of the history of Oxford philosophy, a turning point was the class which you and he gave on C.I. Lewis's Mind and the World Order, which was, I think, the first class ever given on a modern and living author within the Oxford Philosophy School, if not uh, the very first, very nearly the first. And no one had heard at all of C.I. Lewis, who was a professor at Harvard, nor of his book Mind and the World Order, which I think you had noticed in Blackpool and read with pleasure, and this appeared on the lecture list. And I and three friends from Balliol came, two of whom um, were people of very strong political convictions, uh, came to the classes. And there weren't very many persons there. It's in the small room at um, also, also, yes, yeah. in the small lecture room. I think about, about 15, I think. Or 15 or so. Mm. Norman Brown, who we mentioned, was one of the two or three who came. Yes. And um, that was a discussion which was completely without any apparatus of historical scholarship and above all the tone of voice was one of complete relaxation i mean it wasn't a solid yeah. university occasion put it mildly yeah, right. <laughs> and, um, we used to make sort of argumentative plans this group of bail persons to uh, protect you against austin thank you i remember the scene very clearly forming these little <laughs> Um, rather like American football players. But the, the, this absence of solemnity began then, and indeed the main themes that I mentioned before of hypothetical propositions, propositions about the relations between general properties and how these could be fitted into any scheme as either logical truths or empirical truths. Uh, the relation of physical objects to sense data, if there are such things, which Austin even then was beginning to doubt and wrote his famous book after... Or, posthumously published book after the war on, gave the lectures after the war and the book was posthumous Sense and Sensibilia, he already had doubts about the existence of sense data. Yes, I remember that class very well because um, Austin showed up in, his, in a sense of his best and worst there. I mean, he dominated the class through sheer force of intellect. Yes. And it was very good and it was, I think it was literally the first class on a modern philosopher which was held and it's very typical that um, C.I. Lewis should have uh, been the subject, I mean, all you do is should have been the subject we discussed, simply because I happened to pick up a book which looked to me quite interesting, Black was nobody had ever heard the name at all, and I read it by pure accident, so did Austin, at least I recommended it to him, and we thought it had a lot of topics, mm. which we'd profit to discuss, as far as I remember, we didn't get beyond the first six pages of it, but still, it was all very lively and good, and the class was undoubtedly an occasion, and I think that's directly what led to those uh, discussions in the evening, mm. 
Um, in my room's no fellows between um, you and him and uh, Freddie Air and Woosley uh, and yeah. McKinnon, yes. Uh, which is really the official start of what might be called Oxford philosophy rather than philosophy at Oxford. Yes. And that was, the atmosphere was quite different. The, the, the class all still had to win. But in the evenings, uh, it really was a perfectly interesting, I mean, uh, discussion in which we were all equals. Yes. And in which a lot of uh, very interesting things were said. And we had a feeling, which was perhaps rather vain, perhaps rather conceited, that no better discussion of the philosophy could occur, were occurring anywhere in the world at that moment. <laughs> I felt that. <laughs> in, our, in our room, in my room, on those evenings, on those Thursday evenings, whenever it was. Yes. We felt that we were talking about some subjects much more interesting than those that were being discussed by our seniors. We felt we were better at it, that we were discovering truth, that we were progressing. And the atmosphere was one of cumulative excitement, I would have thought. Yes. Uh, in memory, I seem to remember those occasions as being the things which shaped the thought of all of us for many years to come. Yes, I think that is true. I think Freddie was more complete. I must say, Freddie, I think, was already much better shaped than any of us. I think he had a position of his own, which he had uh, evolved for himself, out of, no doubt partly out of the writings of Russell and Carnap and such people, before the class had ever begun, and didn't really budge from there very much. But the rest of it, I think, were in a rather fluid intellectual condition. Yes. Well, uh, the, the... In the sense we were using old-fashioned weapons, it's true, but you see, we didn't actually want um, our philosophers to approximate what Moore was saying, or Carnap was saying, or anybody in particular was saying. Uh, in a way, the zeitgeist works in mysterious ways. Um, in our own fashion, I think we were working towards this kind of looseness. Of yes. Structure, so to speak, in the, in yes. Between 1936 onwards. Not with uh, the boldness, brilliance, imagination of Wittgenstein, of course. Not, not in that sort of way, and it would have helped us a great deal if we did know what the blue books and brown books contained. I'm sure it would. It would have done, yes. yes. but still, in our own fashion, so to speak, we were, I wouldn't say that we were quite in the state in which Keynes describes himself as being, when first Moore uh, began uh, teaching these people, they suddenly felt the heavens opened, and they discovered what generations of men, thousands of years, for thousands of years hadn't known, at last they knew the truth about ethics. For the first time, the full truth had been revealed. You remember, there's a very yes. uh, rhapsodic account by Keynes of what? Yes. How marvellous it was. I didn't think we were ever quite in that condition. Still, we were in a condition of intellectual vitality. We were, we thought we were making progress, breaking through old categories, escaping from all kinds of cages. Yes. And this is, of course, an absolutely irreplaceable un feeling. It's, it's a thing which I've never had a similar intensity since. Yes, it's but In true. Cambridge, they must have felt it much more violently, because Wittgenstein was a man of genius, and he really did uh, excite people immoderately. Yes. And we were... Um, 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 didn't have that. We were... Um, we were workmen-like. Yes, we yeah. plodded, we were plodded. plodded along, yes. and we, he raced and we were all plodded. And also Austin's methods, and Austin was certainly the dominant figure. Yes. Uh, in those classes, can't be denied. Uh, Austin's methods were different from Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein employed his marvelous imagination for the purpose of producing um, completely imaginary examples. What would happen if a clock suddenly spoke to you? The sort of thing that didn't enter into wisdom writings. What would happen if this and that happened, which of course didn't happen, and then from that you try to read off onto real life. Austin thought that that was obviously thought this was too uh, fanciful and wouldn't teach one enough. The great thing was actually to discover how people used words, what they actually meant, what, so to speak, was implied by what, and wanted to keep us on the ground, wanted to keep our feet on the ground. Didn't think that these magnificent flights into all kinds of imaginary possibilities, which Wittgenstein, who had, as I say, an unparalleled force of imagination, excited his listeners with, didn't think that this would lead to profitable results. And the great thing was to keep on the ground and use actual examples from actual life for the purpose of refuting overconfident theories. Yes, but uh, before the war, verbal nuance, in the sense in which Austin introduced it after the war, attention to the difference between different adverbs uh, used no, in excuses, no, no. this was not a feature. Not that we, we attended no. to words with exactness in the sort of way that Pritchard and Moore did yes. uh, under Austin's guidance, yes. but no more than that. No. We didn't claim that philosophical problems would disappear if you followed minutely these uh, differences of force. We didn't between. claim anything. No. We made no claims of any kind. Freddy claimed, Freddy had claimed, but yes. the rest of us didn't. He no, we didn't claim, we just wanted to, such knowledge just came to us. We just yes. advanced. We asked questions to appear to us to be central, such as um, whether there were propositions which were neither strictly empirical nor strictly logical, which, if true, took us back to Kant and took us back to all kinds of important Yes. Uh, philosophical views. We asked questions about appearance and reality. We asked questions about human freedom. We asked questions about hypothetical propositions and the general nature of speculation. 
Yes, in fact. And we hope to obtain light simply by the aid of uh, reasons, if you, by the aid of natural light, without submitting to specific disciplines or without having really worked out any p unique method for solving these problems. Yes, Austin himself certainly hadn't assumed a general well, no, position. He had to mouth, I think. Yes. And bit by bit. But the thing I want to convey is, you see, that we were, uh, anyone who is making progress in a subject becomes naturally uh, excited about it and uh, takes an intense interest in it. And therefore, when people sometimes ask, well, what about politics, what about ethics in this connection, which took a certain amount of interest in these matters, but when one is deeply interested in the subject, the last thing one does is to ask oneself about its implications for something else, because one is too absorbed. One's like a scientist who is actually discovering about the properties of radium or the properties of uh, neutrinos or something, and then if you say, well, what are the implications of this for biology, or what are the implications of this for uh, physiology, at the moment of actual uh, experimentation and discovery, yes. the scientist is wholly absorbed in what he's doing, and he can't bother about these other things. If he did, his attention would become distraught and, and, and dissipated, and it would, uh, wouldn't work at all. Because fundamentally, Oxford philosophers were not interested in the history of philosophy. No. They were interested in the discovery of the truth. I remember a peculiar parody of this. We were always told in the Moral Sciences Club in Cambridge, um, there was a, 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 a philosopher called Dr. Ewing, a respected philosopher now in Cambridge, who had just moved from Oxford to Cambridge, and um, there was some discussion. I suppose with, I don't know if Wittgenstein was actually present, but certainly his disciples were. And uh, he, Dr. Ewing said, Professor Dawes Hicks used to say, or something or other, and the disciples said, we don't want to know what Professor Dawes Hicks used to say. What we want is the truth. <laughs> well, I don't think we went to that extreme, but there was a touch of that amongst us. The history of the subject didn't interest us much. We were not learned, we were not scholars. What we wanted, we thought we really could establish the truth for ourselves, and this was a sufficient reward. And this really follows from the whole Socratic nature of Oxford philosophy, which is, depends on argument, depends on irreverent examination of assumptions, depends on, so to speak, discussion, and not on learning. I mean, we always had this image, perhaps as a caricature, of, say, German philosophy, um, uh, consisting of some eminent professor who was very um, authoritative indeed, um, speaking in a very uh, despotic manner, in a sense. Uh, awe-inspiring manner to his disciples, who were not really allowed to contradict uh, and would only ask in very polite and respectful terms until they imbibed sufficient wisdom from the great man to become professors themselves. This is the exact opposite of what reigned here. I must say, I don't think it was a bad thing. No. I think on the whole it's highly defensible. Sometimes people wonder or ask whether Oxford philosophy wasn't too self-contained, wasn't too self-regarding, wasn't too insulated from the great issues which shook the world and the great political and spiritual issues. Collingwood, for example, in his autobiography himself, accuses people like Pritchard and Joseph of uh, being so arid and so, in a sense, trivial as to drive people into uh, impossible political attitudes by reaction because they didn't give them any spiritual pabulum. People turned into virtually fascists. Freddie Eyre was the most unjust object of attacks of a similar kind by, in the New Statesman, I think. I mean, he was told that uh, the triviality and the verbalism and the aridity of his philosophy drove people into dreadfully reactionary attitudes, uh, again, by reaction against this uh, dry and completely um, spiritually empty stuff which was being served to them. This was monstrous. These charges absolutely monstrous. They were unjust to a degree. We were dealing with problems of great interest, which certainly had implications of a direct kind to the way in which we would weigh political and moral problems. And this is, in fact, what did happen in the case of the political convictions of most of us. And moreover, where were we to look for light if we didn't look to light uh, amongst ourselves? It may sound rather smug and rather self-satisfied, but if you consider what was happening to philosophy outside, take Marxism, for example, which had a great burgeoning after the war, English Marxism worked at a very low level. There were certainly no works by philosophers of a Marxist kind which were worth anything at all. No, there was it was no slum. Attempt. It was an absolute slum. There was nobody of ability was dealing with it. Now the Marx, now the communists of first class intellectual ability had nothing to do with Marxist philosophy or dialectical materialism or anything of that kind. Russia, well I read Russian, and I can testify to the fact that nothing poured out except bureaucratic gibberish. Absolutely mechanical stuff, which wasn't up to any kind of intellectual standard at all. Those of us who uh, formed the, the smaller group and were interested in logical positivism still had what one might call a general point of view in resistance to 
any kind of metaphysical claims, which isn't after all just claims within philosophy itself, but this spills over into ordinary life. I mean, one, so to speak, read the newspapers or read, above all things like literary criticism, a perfectly different spirit, because notoriously literary criticism is filled with um, unverifiable statements. Okay. <laughs> so is criticism in all the arts, criticism in um, a painting. And this had a, a very strong intellectual influence, which literary persons in the New States and, and elsewhere resented, resented strongly because they felt their disciplines threatened with a kind of reductive criticism which would have cut the ground from under their feet. So, although the word ideology doesn't help very much because it's too imprecise a word, those who were deeply influenced by the Vienna Circles, I certainly was, and took the, um, the verification principle seriously, namely the claim that all statements had to be in some way or other testable for their truth or force to be discovered by a regular procedure, whether or not this was an experimental procedure or a procedure within mathematics or logic of a strictly deductive kind, there must be a procedure. You can't have statements which claim to be believed, which hang in the air without your knowing how to find out whether in fact the evidence or argument supports them. Now this led one to be not only extremely skeptical about standard left-wing writing, standard sociological theories which often consisted of uh, wildly metaphysical statements, uh, Marxism itself, which uh, contains carryovers from Hegel of a notoriously metaphysical kind, uh, and so on, it, it did affect one's general outlook. I, mm. Therefore, when we had arguments about whether pink is more like red or like black, which was trying to discuss whether there were propositions which we all would recognize as to have a sense and as being true, and still weren't in any sense, precise sense, verifiable, there was a certain heat or um, it wasn't just a kind of intellectual game, one minded very much how this came out. But all these things mattered to us, for example, the question of whether value judgments had any rational structure. After all, this is highly ideologically or emotionally laden question, emotion laden question, as to whether uh, our fundamental moral beliefs are really just emotional reactions, as was sometimes suggested, or had no rational structure, whatever. These are the sort of questions which people don't contemplate calmly. And the old men who protested that, um, I say just in a kind of joke sense, old men, they weren't necessarily old, but um, respectable opinion outside the university, mm -hmm. which said, well, what's happened to the young men are all taught that value judgments are mere exclamations. They did fear for the body politic a little. I mean, yes. there was something very yes. subversive was going on. So it's in no case a simple opposition, either what, what we were all thinking about Marxism and left-wing movements in Europe, or we were politically apathetic. Because in a wider sense of political, which includes general moral attitudes, the, the issues were highly charged. And I certainly, I remember, felt emotionally very attracted to the verification principle. I mean, every time we suffered more every time we suffered a reverse yes. by a, a very good country example being produced, and we couldn't give a decent account of a uh, single pink hypothetical pink proposition, I was distressed. Mark. I felt that's what pink, red, and black was more. Exactly. Let I me felt, don't explain about this proposition. Yes. It's quite simple. If you say that pink is more like red and it is like black, what kind of proposition is it? It's obviously true. Yes. Nobody would die. It's general. Any instance of pink is more like any instance of red than it is like the instance of black. Now, if it's, a, in, if it's an empirical general proposition, one ought to be able to conceive of what it would be like for it to be falsified. But nobody could conceive of any universe in which pink was more like black than it was like red and was still pink. If it wasn't that, if it was an a priori proposition, then in those days we used to think that the contradictories of a priori propositions had to be self-contradictory. Well, uh, yes, or they had to be inferred from definitions of terms. Or definitions from the definition of terms, exactly. Well, as we didn't define pink, red, and black, except by pointing to them, you didn't. You can't, of course, define pink or a particular shade of pink. A blind man um, wouldn't know what it was, whatever definitions you gave him. And therefore, since you uh, define these things ostensibly, as we used to say, by just pointing to examples of them and said, there's pink, yes. there's red, there's black. Now, I say to you, anything like this will always be more like this, that it will be like that. What kind of proposition was it? It didn't on the face of it appear to be a priori because it's contradictory. It was not self-contradictory and it didn't appear to be empirical because uh, it couldn't be thought of as falsifiable. And this puzzled us. 
Mrs. Wright's and brother. This, right, and, brother this, and this appeared incompatible with a simply stated verification principle, which Freddie Air and others wanted to be true. Yes, and Air used to try it first one way and then the other way. Yes. Uh, and this uh, is a great breach of the wall. But yes. from this breach, all kinds of terrible things might pour in. What people used to feel, uh, who felt like him, was that once a breach was knocked to the wall, all kinds of dreadful things would happen. Metaphysics would find its way back again. And then all this work of dredging, all this work of removing all this huge mud of previous metaphysical um, confusion might, after all, be in vain, because through this chink, all the horrors would pile up again. Yes, That's now, what that we could go through each one of these subjects we say we discussed and produce an example. That's why it was of our interest. I mean, it wasn't just a trivial proposition about pink, red, and black. That's why what I wanted to establish was that why this was important is because it had huge general importance for the general nature of uh, truth. Yes, because the axe that was used on all respectable beliefs, particularly of a moral and religious character, was the axe of the verification principle. And every time you showed that it was imperfect in accepted cases, that you couldn't show that they were verifiable, then the axe became so much less effective. So, Granted, yes. So there was an other minds, other minds, when we discussed other minds. Yes. We discussed what the verification was of supposing that other people had headaches, which would, you didn't yourself experience. Yes. And the Ryla remember being speculated about whether you could give someone else's headache might suddenly strike you. You would suddenly say, damn, I've got his headache. Yes. <laughs> How can I get rid of it? Would this make any sense and so on? This also had something to do with the apparent inadequacy of simple verification principles for verifying propositions about experiences in other people's minds. So it was desperately said uh, behaviorism was assumed as a possible posture of defense. Right. Namely, that when I talked about your internal state's mind, your, your, your headaches or your good giddiness or your n feeling of nausea, I was really talking about the physical manifestations of these. And, the, yeah, and that therefore, they had, and that seemed very unplausible because it yeah. didn't seem when I was talking about my nausea, giddiness, or I was talking about my physical manifestations of nausea or giddiness. Well, and yeah. we, therefore, the. Well, I mean, the, uh, in simple words, if I said I have, I have a headache, I was actually referring to a pain which I was suffering. Yes. But if I said you have a headache, all I meant was your face is growing red. If I ask you have you a headache, I shall hear a noise which says yes. <laughs> and yet when I talk about my own headache, I don't mean any of these things. I mean I'm actually in pain. Yes. Well, it seemed asymmetrical. Why should I assume that I had a pain, whereas all you were was just an automaton emitting noises of a certain kind? <laughs> and that you have a headache was wholly, as we analyze, wholly different from I have a headache. This was always unplausible. There was another breach in this wall. Well, Temperamentally, some people like mending the wall and some people like knocking holes in it. Austin was a, on the whole a hole knocker. Very much and so. And Freddie was a mender. Yes. And the conflict between them, as I remember it in those rooms in all in 36 onwards, was uh, Freddie was like an irresistible missile and Austin was like an impenetrable obstacle. <laughs> <laughs> and when one came <laughs> against the other, extraordinary things happened. It really, the sparks which were generated uh, really enlightened us all. Yes. Well, in fact, I in what is historically known as Oxford philosophy, which is what happens under the influence of Wittgenstein and after the war, then most of the criticisms that you and others made, of you and Austin and others made, of the Carnap air position have been, as it were, become an orthodoxy, have been supported, uh, have become the mm. accepted opinion, yes. because the discrimination of whole classes of judgments with only two or three or even four pigeonholes has dropped absolutely out of practice and no one, no Oxford philosopher now, I think I may say, would make any such sweeping statement as all statements are of this kind or of that kind. And uh, the influence of Wittgenstein, which we didn't have, which wasn't available to us, it, just was to make one look at the individual examples and sort them into smaller and smaller piles and see the differences it's interesting and despair because, of yeah. making anything. It's interesting historically that we should have been doing the same thing less skillfully and of course with far less ability in Wittgenstein was doing it about the same time without consciously uh, not, uh, knowing, not, 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 even not consciously knowing, not knowing at all yes. what was really going on in Cambridge th at that time. We were always asking Wittgenstein to come, of course. It isn't as if we heard of this great genius from 1931 onwards. Every Oxford Philosophical Society was always begging him to come, and he was always saying he would come, and at the end a telegram would arrive saying, you had a cold. Yes, unable to never in fact. Reason or another, so he never came until after the war. The great period really runs from 45, just after the war, till the end of the 50s. Mm -hmm. Weissmann and Austin are the dominant figures when it begins, 
and the complementary gifts, one very precise and dry and reductive, and the other rather extravagant and imaginative, but both conveying quite distinctly the idea that very careful examination of varieties of usage, varieties of grammar, in, on traditional problems such as the problem of the freedom of the will or the nature of the explanation of human actions and motives and causes and so on, that this was the way to do philosophy. And um, back people came from the war and were convinced that this was the way. At the same time, Ryle was um, writing reductively about thought and saying that um, we were quite wrong to think, also derived from Wittgenstein, we were quite wrong to think that um, when we thought uh, a procession of mental events were taking place in our head, which we could separately identify as episodes, this was not at all the case. Now, all these, I suppose, are thoughts that came from Wittgenstein, with the exception of Austin, whom this was not true, whose conviction that the verbal method, the way of words, and even the examination of dictionaries in a systematic way would contribute to philosophy, came from his own thought and, as I suggested, perhaps a little from his experience in the war, because I remember him talking to me in Oxford Circus in, I suppose, about 1942, in the then shop Peter Robinson, which had been taken over by something called Cossack, which was the original staff for 12th Army Group, not 12th Army Group, 21 Army Group, 21st Army Group, which became the invasion force for Europe. And he was sitting there at that time with a long room with a lot of intelligence officers and they were examining the sand on the beaches of Norway and various places and the tides and collecting all sorts of geographical information um, and doing it in a very systematic way and he was a famous figure throughout the staffs uh, of the indeed when I remember meeting him in Chafe uh, uh, as it later was he was in charge at the time of the demobilization of the German forces under an American general he was the only person who knew all where the German army was at, at uh, the uh, handover at Reims. And he was a great figure in Frankfurt. He was a tremendous organizer. And he, he, uh, his wartime experience gave him the belief that why philosophy hadn't progressed was that um, we'd all gone by inspired individual guesses. What we wanted was a, dis a disciplined attack, mm -hmm. where you solve other problems. And he proposed, remember, something called the Frontis Cherion, remember, yes. which would be a building yes. in which we should all meet and we'd have assigned tasks to examine the various uses of true, no, and so on. He wrote a famous article, incidentally, just after the war, which had an enormous influence, particularly over people like Herbert Hart on knowledge, which is a very brilliant article. And also one on a priori concepts, but particularly the one on knowledge, which was read at an Aristotelian society meeting and was about other minds, the subject we were discussing before, but actually he concentrated entirely on the notion of knowledge and indicated or hinted in a very indirect way when we say, I know, we make a kind of claim and we don't simply make a statement about ourselves of an autobiographical kind, nor do we simply uh, assert a proposition we assert in a particular way. And this led on to his later doctrines of the performative uses of language, the different speech acts that there are. And this is, incidentally, a subject which is still alive in America and is created by Austin, the study of speech acts, which is on the borderline of linguistics and uh, philosophy. I mean, the difference between recommending, praying, asking, and so on. And what, of course, appealed to him was that when I say, and so on, it really could go on for hours and hours and hours. And when he had a year off, he did, in fact, write down endless speech acts on large sheets of yellow paper. I remember walking around Addison's Walk and him showing me these things. And I remember him saying, well, don't you see there's a big difference between describing her as an air hostess and calling her <laughs> an air hostess. The example was rather typical. It's flatness, the notion of an air hostess. I couldn't see any different story. He was very, but he, he was introducing these long lists. It was quite different from Wittgenstein quite different from Weizmann, and different again from Ryle. Austin invented the term performative to refer to certain utterances which cannot be said to be true or false in the ordinary sense because they constitute an action rather than report a fact. For example, if you promise to do something, it's rather like naming a ship or baptizing a child. You can do it happily or unhappily, Austin used to say, 
That is, you can fulfill the action or you can fail to fulfill it. Austin died in 1960. There's one recording of him lecturing that survives. It was made by an amateur at a lecture in Göteborg a year before Austin's death. The quality's poor, but here's an excerpt from it. Even in ceremonies or rituals that are not verbal at all, we have devices which in just the same way make explicit what act is being performed. For example, supposing I appear before you and bow deeply from the waist. It may be quite uncertain what I am doing. I may be simply bending down to observe the flowers or to tie my shoelace. But it's possible that what I am doing is some form of obeisance to you, some form of homage. Now, in order to clear up this unfortunate kind of ambiguity, we usually invent some little device such as uh, raising our hat or saying salam, with which to accompany the bow, and by means of which to make our act explicitly and unambiguously one of doing obeisance or homage. Nobody would wish to say, however, that raising your hat describes what you are doing. It merely makes it constitute it explicitly an act of homage. And so, putting I promise that at the head of the performative utterance makes explicit what act you are doing, and Eo Ipso does the act, but it does not describe it. Austin came to doubt whether even ordinary statements of fact are always either true or false. He began to suspect that they too can be subject to happiness or unhappiness in the same way as performatives, for example, in the case of historical statements. And so with uh, Lord Raglan and the Battle of Alma. Alma, in case you didn't know, why should you, was what we call a soldier's battle, if ever there was one. Well, of course, Lord Raglan was in command. Ordinarily, he was in command of the British, though not of the French, and the French were supposed to do what the British indicated they would like them to do, and to a minor extent possibly did so. It happens to be true that none of Lord Raglan's orders were ever transmitted. Well, did he win the battle of Alma? Well, of course, in some context, it's perfectly justifiable to say so. Uh, something of an exaggeration, maybe. Of course, any question of giving the old fool a medal for it, that's why I'm looking smart. I wouldn't want to dwell on his having won the battle in that case. What do you think really inspired Austin towards all this? Just hatred of impressionism. And hatred of, as you say, disorganized guesswork. And the fact that if you propounded the theory, the only way in which you could establish it was by looking at all the cases to which it might be applied. And considering uh, having teams of people working concertedly in order to at least to dehydrate one piece of territory upon which we could stand. Dry land, this bit had been done. Yes, done. The word real, for example, had to be examined. I mean, this is a kind of central word. But yes. Central then you, well, then you had to painfully to go through real. When you say this table is real, what are you contrasting it with? Are you contrasting it with a hallucinatory table, hallucination of a table, or are you contrasting it with a table mountain, which can be called a table, but obviously not a table in the ordinary sense, or are you contrasting it with a toy table, or are you contrasting it with some other use of the word table, I don't know, multiplication table. Something yes. that kind of talk. And although this seems rather tedious, perhaps this is a rather more like attitude by which maybe we should be able to get to a great system in the end, but in the meanwhile we must simply clear the ground of the undergrowth or the waterlogged condition into which it's got. And for God's sake, can't we have a team of people working on this first and then we shall have some dry land to stand on. From there we can proceed to the next point, but it's got to be done systematically and thoroughly, and the ground once won must be forever kept. And so like people could never make very general statements about the word real again if he'd had six Oxford College tutors working for six months on the word real, then no one would dare say, given its body of evidence, yes. the sort of things I'm now saying about the uses of the word real or whatever yes. other word is involved. Yes. They wouldn't dare do it anymore yes. because it'd be this. And then gradually, why shouldn't it be like science? After all, it's taken people 40 years to discover how, and some of them men of genius, how a nerve 
impulse goes along a nerve fibre. Now they think they may know. Why should we, Austin would say, and I think he did say, but not with that example, why should we suppose we discover what the notion of reality is or the notion of truth by some sort of amazing shortcut? Yes. Not at all. We must get down to it. We must work away as people do in the laboratories. Similarly, you see, for example, Victor, Victor said talk about language games, you remember? Yes. And also said games. Very well. In that case, we must consider why is it a game? In what sense is it a game? Is it a game like football? Or is it a game like um, cards? Or what kind of game is it? Is it a game with... What about the rules of the games? Who establishes rules in the case of games? And who establishes the rules in the case of language? I mean, is this an energy to request? How far? Yes. There are all kinds of games which differ from each other. Which kind of game is language if it is a game at all? This seems to me, this is the kind of thing you used to discuss at his head. Well, more than discuss, he actually got people to, to allocate to, to look up the different yes. kinds of games and how rules, so that people just couldn't laxly say it's like it's rules like of a game. game when you have see, rules of yes, game. He didn't want that pursuit, did he? He didn't want just no. brilliant flashes. The last thing he wanted. Yes. He would say, what about the Arabian trick track, which I remember? <laughs> One of the rules of which was that if you cheated and weren't caught out, you could win. <laughs> was it a game? Was that a rule of the game? Or was it, on the contrary, a rule about rules? And in that case, was, was it, were there analogies in language? Were there analogies in thought? Yes. One of the things which Austin seems to me, although, of course, he was very fascinated by words as such, as Moore was, too, before him. Yes. And this sometimes led him into mere uh, grammar, and mere philology. Oh, my God. himself. Undoubtedly did. Yes. Undoubtedly did. Nevertheless, I think what he was concerned with, and what everybody who did this kind of thing was concerned with, was, of course, the nature of human thinking. I think they philosophers of that particular school did themselves no service when they spoke about themselves as linguistic because that conveyed the general impression that they really were interested in language for the sake of language. They weren't. Austin was, you know. He yes, really he loved did. reading the dictionary. Yes, he I know, but this wasn't the program. I, uh, it wasn't the program, no, no, no. About no, his objective, it's absolutely true, yes. And that was, it sometimes wanted to offer to mere study of language. I agree, it became rather uh, uninteresting to, to, to those who were interested. But the program, the desire, so to speak, was uh, to the old philosophical desire to examine, in, in some sense, structure, if there was a structure, in any ways in which we thought about things. Yes, but um, not to publicize any conclusions or utter any conclusions until one really covered the ground systematically. I think he really no, but he yeah. thought we thought in words. Really he thought we thought in symbols. And unless we attended to the structure of the symbols, we would never know what oh, of course. Yes. No, but this yes. is yes. said, you see, because after all, he, he and his followers have been accused of mere, mere linguistic knowledge, which somehow was remote from the great concerns of the world, the great spiritual agonies into which people get. And this would seem to be a trivial word game of some sort, fiddling, while the world was burning in all kinds of ways. And it wasn't that. It was concerned with precisely the same problems as Aristotle or Hume or Kant were concerned with. Yes. Not different. Uh, n but there was a really different it's vision of, uh, yes, but there was a different good. vision of what you could do in philosophy. He really thought you ought not to write about truth or the freedom of the will. I remember writing something about the freedom of the will and going to his class, which was uh, always uh, uh, an enjoyable, amusing thing. And he produced country examples and a lot of students, and we discussed them. And then I said to him afterwards, well, some of the country examples I agree and some of them were rather invented so to speak, they were freak counter-examples. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh yes, but that's the point. I mean, one, one wants to have the freak counter-examples so that everyone can see that you can't really systematize the field beyond a certain point. I mean, it is utterly... Uh, well, well, that was very, if true, true, if true, spread, up, if true, spread up. He was a very serious man, wasn't he? Well, he really was a very then, serious thinker. Yes. The great thing about him, it wasn't just fascination with his own skills. He was a serious thinker. The freedom of the will was a subject which I don't think preoccupied him, which, which, which undoubtedly was of interest to him. And he somehow believed that the arguments about freedom of the will by determinists and anti-determinists were mere theoretical games and weren't serious because he didn't believe that anyone really believed in determin determinism. Yes. He may have been mistaken about that. What he said to me was, it's all very well these people saying they're determinists. I've never met a determinist. I've never met anyone who behaved as if you were a determinist. I've never met anyone who used language as if he believed it. And I don't believe that anyone really has believed it. It's just a theoretical construct. Well, he may or may not have been right. Mm -hmm. But it was a very different approach from someone who just pounces, if you see what I mean, on any linguistic expression, no matter what, and applies brilliant techniques for its analysis just for its own sake. I want to convey that he really was concerned with the solutions to the problems themselves, yes. and not the mere application, so to speak, mm -hmm. of a technique which he thought really could draw anything up, so to speak.
I think it's quite important to realize, and that's and that is the source of his moral influence. And that is why he impressed not his cleverness, but his his, his yes. intensity and his extreme, uh, if you like, moral seriousness about it. Yes, yes. And he did think that was the way to, as regards the burnings in the world and the horrors outside, that uh, the best thing we could do, which is no doubt something small, would be to make people sensible. Yes. And that meant th that they wouldn't be governed by overarching theories. Yes. And that is what philosophy could do for them. And therefore he was a tremendously enthusiastic teacher from that point of view. I mean, uh, he really enjoyed getting a Harvard audience to not believe that the whole of Quine applied perfectly to the structure of ordinary language uh, or, or something of this kind. And undermining, uh, he began his lectures with the phrase, I think, didn't he? I'm, I'm going to tamper with your beliefs a little. Yes. That was the phrase yes, used, to tamper yes, with your beliefs. Yes. 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 yes.